Well, good morning from here in London and also from out in Stroud. Today's FS Club topic is new shoots, people making fresh choices in a changing world. And we're delighted to welcome back, actually, Patricia Lustig, the Chief Executive of Lhasa Insight, and Jill Ringland, an Emeritus Fellow at SAMI Consulting. Uh, Patricia and Jill have written a number of books together, uh, as well as separately, and they've worked on projects for clients from the European Commission to train leasing companies. Both of them have held major jobs in industry, and this makes them unusual amongst futurists and led them to understand the importance of foresight, not just to futurists, but particularly to people with day jobs, <laughs> uh, and to reach people with day jobs outside the foresight circle. They blog regularly, for example, on our long finance pamphleteer uh, series. And in this session, they're going to share some insights from their new book, New Shoots. Now, you'll know me. I'm Michael Minelli. I'm one of the directors of Zen Group. And it is really a privilege to be able to introduce so many of these webinars on technology, economics, and finance. And I can only do so uh, thanks to the tolerance and generosity of our sponsors. And we are delighted uh, to, to present this today because I think what Tricia and Bill have got to say is important to all of us. We're talking basically about the future of humanity. Now, the format today is a fairly familiar one to those of you who've been to these before. Uh, my job is to get out of the way as quickly as possible. Uh, we'll have a 20-minute presentation from Patricia and Jill, and then a question and answer session for about 20 minutes as well, a real opportunity to engage. I might make three quick points. Uh, firstly, all of the slides are available and are already up. You can find them up on the website. Uh, and there's also links, of course, to the book uh, to purchase it if you so wish. Uh, secondly, we uh, will be taking in the Q&A questions and answers through the GoToWebinar facility. Uh, please do use that because I'm here with you. I will feed them into the conversation, but I'm not on Signal or email or anything else. Uh, and uh, very finally, please note that when you do send in questions, comments, or observations, uh, they'll all be sent to Tricia and Joe, particularly if you want to get in touch about some specific point of detail. Now, we had a quick poll to start with, and that poll is really looking at your views. Do you feel optimistic or pessimistic about the future of humanity? Uh, this is kind of a tough poll, uh, and I know the audience, uh, FS Club audience, can be quite uh, straightforward and opinionated, and uh, we've got uh, just about half of the audience have voted. We'll leave it open just a few more seconds. It's great. Okay, and with most of the audience having voted, uh, here we go. Well, a broadly optimistic audience, uh, or somewhere in between, with about 20% feeling pessimistic. So, uh, Tricia and Jill, um, I'll hand over to you. Uh, the floor is very much yours, um, but let's see if we can make it a happier day for 20% of our audience. <laughs> so, thank you, Michael. Um, uh, our book uh, arises out of all the work we've been doing over the past years, uh, and as Michael said, we, we're very much concerned about engaging people in being able to make better decisions by using foresight. And so the book is for, for real people. We're integrators, so there are probably people in the audience who know more about individual aspects of politics, economics, society, technology than we do. But what we're looking at is the impact of forces for change on people, and this spans silos. And so we've uh, done a lot of work on what the future might look like, and a result of uh, exploring the, all this, we have really surprisingly uh, come to optimistic conclusions about the future. And so really intrigued by the poll, which shows that the audience is broadly optimistic about the future or neutral as well. So this is an absolute delight. And so what we can do is we can share with you the reasons that some of the reasons that we're optimistic about the future and look forward in the Q&A to sharing more. Uh, Peace to the next slide, please. So the background to this is our work in uh, helping people get more comfortable with thinking about the future over the years, uh, starting with scenario planning. Uh, the first book that Patricia and I wrote together was Beyond Crisis. 
uh, we then, and those were both books for strategy people, basically. And then we wrote Here Be Dragons, which is the sort of book that um, pe futurists give to their relatives at Christmas to explain what it is they do. It's a story about how foresight is used. Uh, Patricia's written a, uh, the standard Bible, in fact, won a lot of awards on methods and tools for strategic foresight. And uh, we have also wrote a book back in uh, 2018, three years ago, on megatrends and how to survive them. And as the title suggests, we were pretty defensive about the future at that stage. And so what's happened? Well, in a way, COVID has happened. Peter, could we have the next slide, please? COVID has caused a lot of people to rethink. A lot of people have been rethinking based on business as usual. We actually think the world's changed and that methods and tools are not enough for people. They actually need a framework for thinking about the outside world and the changes. And this is our role as a bridge person, a bridge people. And so we've written new shoots and structured it to find multiple ways of engaging with people who are not professional futurists, probably not even professional strategists, but people who have what we call day jobs. Okay, so for the next slide, we've written the book. And uh, as you can see, there's a quote from Michael, I'm not sure whether you'll be able to see on your screen, uh, on the front, which says, the book goes beyond the cliches. And another of our reviewers says, it's a message of hope. It uses a number of techniques and it's designed to empower people to take action, to build a better society and to make fresh choices in a changing world. So the next slide is more detail than we want. This is the structure of the book. There's a lot of research gone into it, a lot of thinking about the narrative, and we're delighted when people uh, read the introduction and skip to the conclusion and then go back and read the chapters that interest them. So it, it's a, a good story and people enjoy reading it. Over to the next slide, please. All right. Um... New Shoots engages people because it's based on real, real life, real stories. It's based on our research and the consultancy that we've done. And we updated it by all the things that we've learned when we were at different conferences and doing different webinars and our experiences with people in day jobs and what actually stops them sleeping at night. So each chapter describes forces for change and it helps people to engage in three ways. It helps to manage uncertainty by informing people. It's like learning, sorry, you've gone too far. You go back one. Um, it's like learning to dive. It helps uh, extending imagination, and we do that. We can give you an example of how to do that. And it helps people challenge assumptions by looking for evidence in places you might not. What we want is to empower people to change. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, we use the analogy of, of scuba diving, and you might guess that we're both scuba divers, so it comes easy to us. Managing uncertainty is because we don't understand the world, we don't know how it's going to be. So it's a bit like scuba diving. You have to learn to live in a new world. When you, when you scuba dive, you go underwater. You have to learn to breathe when you're underwater. You have to learn to move around when you're not held to the earth by gravity and everything's 3D, the, the flora and fauna are different, the dangers are different. So you need to learn how to relate to the creatures and the landscape, seascape, and how to find your way in a new world. And that's when we look at the ambiguity around us, that's what we're sort of doing in learning to manage uncertainty. So you learn to dive by identifying what the risks are, and thinking through what you would need to do and practicing it so that it becomes sort of second nature so that you can start to actually enjoy being down there. And what we talk about is looking at the ambiguity, thinking how things might work out, thinking about the risks and how to deal with them, practicing them, and then getting on with things and finding it a little bit more interesting and easy. 
Next slide, please. You can also borrow other people's imagination to extend your own. So you can provoke your imagination by using science fiction, which could be books or it could be films. It uses imagination to give glimpses of possible futures. Now these can be utopian or dystopian. In fact, there are more dystopian ones than utopian ones around because I think bad news sells. But even in dystopian ones, you can find interesting pieces that you think, hey, that might be something I'd like, or I could build upon that and it would be different. I could make something better. So looking at science fiction and relating it to today, it can help change the way you see today. So we hope New Shoots extends your imagination in the way that Star Trek, which is actually a utopian vision, fascinated a generation. The snapshots at the end of each chapter provide images of little, little sort of a paragraph story of people taking action in a changing world. So next slide, please. So we challenge assumptions by looking at things. And one of the ones that we looked at was the book Future Shock, which was written by Alvin and Heidi Toffer in 1970. And they said that future shock was when there's too much change over a short period of time, it brings about shattering stress and disorientation. They interviewed hundreds of experts, corporate executives and senior professionals, and asked them what their concerns were around the pace of change, their anxieties about adapting to it, and their fears for the future. And we looked at that because we were asked to write a chapter looking at Future Shock 50 years on. And we wanted to see if it was really as they said. So we looked at the evidence. We looked at today's people, Generation Z and Millennials, so people born after 1980. And we asked the question, what do you think about these things? What do you think about the pace of change? Change has certainly accelerated, but not all generations are equally stressed or disoriented. And we think that Generation Z and Millennials, who obviously there's a little bit of, um, how should we say this, friction between the different generations, them and their parents, who might be, not always, but might be a little bit discombobulated by the rate of change but we think they are stellar because they're managing it and they're moving on and they're doing wonderful things. And you'll see some stories about that too that we'll share with you later on. So next slide, please. The book is structured in three ways and they, they tap all those three things on the head. So um, the, the headers are how things might play out, disruptors, snapshots, stories of a person making fresh choices and how we got there. In the next slide, we will look at some of the evidence that makes us optimistic. Over to you, Jill. Thank you, Tricia. It's all about people. And so let's start with this slide, uh, which shows the distribution, both of the numbers of people and their uh, financial situation in 1800, 1975, and 2015. Uh, red is people in Asia. And one of the surprising things to a lot of us in the West is that most people in the world are in Asia. Even more importantly, perhaps, uh, in 1800, most people were below the poverty line. In 1975, uh, most of uh, Asia, uh, was above the poverty line, as was uh, Europe and North America. Sorry, by 1975, Europe and North America were above the poverty line. And by 2015, uh, Asia, most of Asia was above the poverty line with Africa still lagging. Now, the reason that this is important is not just financial, it's because once people are out of poverty, they're able to make choices. And so we are seeing that the majority of the people in the world now are no longer below the poverty line and are able to make choices. This is really important. It's so different from where we've ever been before as a, as a planet. So the next slide shows one of the consequences of people having choices. These are graphs of the global population to 2100. 
Now, the official line, if you like, the UN population curve shows population increasing. That's the red line, shows it popu population increasing all through the century. The evidence is increasing that that is not what it's going to be like, partly because of things in China, uh, also in India, but globally. And so the uh, thick gray line is from a book that we found really useful called Empty Planet, which suggests that a peak might, of population might be about 2050. The blue curve is from EASA, which is a Austrian research institute. Uh, the bottom curve is from jo Joseph Randers, who was one of the authors of Limits to Growth, showing a peak about 2040. And the green curve is from uh, Senye, Dr. Senye, who was uh, chief economist uh, at uh, Deutsche Bank when he uh, looked at this and thought the peak was about 2050. Uh, out of this, we conclude that the peak will certainly be in the century. And we, we can understand the reason for it. The reason for it is that when women get educated, they move, or when they go to cities, they get more educated. Once they get educated, they're able to decide whether they want to have children or not, and family sizes decrease. So the global population trajectory is because people have got more choices. So the next slide is going to be the third force, and Trisha is going to talk about this one because she can pronounce the Dutch title of the book. Uh, Rutger Brechtman is a Dutch journalist, and he wrote a book called Humankind. In Dutch, that's the meest de mensen deugen. It's about how, if you dig down into the facts, you find out that most people are actually pretty decent and want to do good. Many people have assumptions on things, and that's probably based on what they read in the newspaper or, or hear on the news or about books. And one of the books that has made quite an impact was Lord of the Flies. It's about a gang of boys who get left on a deserted island and become cannibals. Now, Brechtman, he shares an example of what can happen. It's a true story about a group of Polynesian boys who borrowed a boat from a neighbor, and they actually ended up going to jail for it when they got found. Um, and they got lost and landed on a deserted isle, and they stayed there for 18 months until they were found. Unlike the boys in Lord of the Flies, the novel, they supported one another, they were healthy when they were found, and they helped one another to survive, and they didn't eat anyone. He also examines some experiments that were done that are well known, and he did that by looking, digging up the old laboratory uh, notebooks and finding out that what was reported was not what actually happened. In the, uh, the book, he uses anthropology and zoology to argue that Homo sapiens evolution was based on social skills and cooperation. We learned from each other better than our near relatives and Neanderthals who had larger brains. Brechtman calls us Homo puppy, and we love that. So think about it. Think about what you have actually seen and experienced. If you think about it, you might find that there are a lot more people being decent than you kind of have in your overall mindset. Brechtman is a good debunker of assumptions, and we agree with him. Jill. And so picking up the story about Homo puppy, uh, Homo puppy is using technology. And uh, technology has become pervasive. Technology is often thought of as a threat. Uh, we, we just see so many examples of people using technology to get stuff done. And an example that has not somewhat lost is the Green Revolution, which just changed the world from being short of food to having enough food for everybody. Uh, yeah, supply chain difficulties and yeah, local difficulties on pricing, but the Green Revolution was amazing. Science, governments, uh, individuals, people, farmers, it's happened. And of course, a more recent example is the development of the COVID-19 vaccines in 10 months rather than 10 years, done by cooperation between homo puppies. 
Uh, something that's less visible to most of us in the West probably is the uh, amazing effects of low cost, reliable money transfers, uh, given that a lot of uh, countries in the developing world are very dependent on remittances and having reliable low cost ways of uh, getting money back home is, has been incredibly important and continues to be important. Really hardly any need to talk about the amazing effect of uh, uh, technology on the ability of families and social connections to take place over a distance. Uh, even really uh, organizations that I would not have thought of as, as high tech like the Fine Arts Guild found that uh, because they had to meet remotely during uh, COVID, they trebled their numbers because people just found it so much more convenient. And that's happened to all sorts of societies, uh, as well as, of course, to families being able to link uh, across the world. But maybe most significant is the effect of using technology to tackle global warming. Now, one of the reasons we were pessimistic when we wrote Megatrends was that nobody seemed to be doing anything about global warming uh, except wringing their hands. Now people are talking about, they've got past, oh my God, they're going to, what are we going to do about it? A friend of ours used to sell computers to big companies. And uh, she said, once the purchase started asking the price, she knew she had a sale. And so we think that people have started asking the price of how to tackle global warming. And that means things will happen. And so these are some reasons why we feel optimistic because people are using technology. And then the last reason comes back to on our next slide. Generation Z and millennials. Uh, we've uh, written a, a, a blog about this with some detail. Uh, so just to very briefly say, uh, Dr. Erda Aradotir, uh, an Icelandic lady who is running CarbFix, which has found a, uh, an energy efficient way, an energy neutral way even, of fixing carbon using natural, uh, it, it, using the, uh, the Earth's ingredients. Mm -hmm. No need to uh, go into detail about Greta Thunberg. She continues to be on a lot of platforms and uh, inspire a lot of uh, uh, activist. Uh, our Nigerian friend is a student in Toronto who got fed up of trying to phone home and finding there was no power for his uh, family's phone and so set up a, a solar powered bank of batteries. Uh, Nayantara, I can't pronounce the rest of her name to my embarrassment. Kachapati. Kachapati. Thank you. Uh, runs a, a b, b in Nepal called the Yellow House. And that was where a group of millennials met in 2015 after the earthquake to decide they needed to do something. And that doing something involved getting people across the world to help with mapping, to help with funding, to help with providing supplies to reach the parts of Nepal that were not being handled by government. So instead of complaining about government, they just went ahead and did stuff. And this is a message across all of these. Uh, Sebastian Gro is the person behind a uh, cooperative, a sort of social enterprise in uh, Bangladesh, which allows people to uh, use a microgrid to uh, supply their neighbours with electricity if they have solar panels on their roof. And Vaita Koran is somebody who has believed in green hydrogen. Uh, went and set up a plant in Thailand and is now in Germany with a company employing, uh, coming up to a couple of hundred people, uh, getting, scaling up ways of uh, getting green hydrogen. The book's got lots of examples of snapshots, we call them, of people making things happen. Just thought it was useful to mention the six because this is one of the reasons why we're optimistic about the future. Back to Patricia on the next slide. These are some of our conclusions that we came up with. Because there are fewer people in poverty than ever before, it means more people have the ability to make choices. And that 
just gives us many, many more options as a human race. Uh, population with family sizes falling, I mean, even uh, you can look at China, even India is approaching 2.1 uh, replacement, which is just replacement level um, on fertility rates for their women. So that is something that is really positive. People are basically decent and want to do the right thing. And if that's the case, again, that's a reason for optimism. And if we look for it and act on it, we will find it. Technology is neutral. Its regulation is still evolving, but it is um, an enabler and it can do a lot more than we've already seen. We just have to think about it carefully. Generation Z and millennials are proving to be amazing. Unlike what many think, they are doing fantastically. Three years ago, when we wrote Megatrends, we were pessimistic, but now we are optimists. And the last slide, please. Just some links for us if you'd like to get in touch. So thank you, and if I may hand over to Michael. Well, thank you very much, Jill and Tricia. That was really super. Um, I'm beginning to think futurists are bipolar. They, <laughs> they, they flip between optimistic and pessimistic all the time, um, but it's good. I did put a question in uh, to the chat room, folks, so please do answer. The 18% the of you that were pessimistic, please do put in uh, reasons why, because I'd like to feed those in particularly. Um, but let's start with uh, an interesting area, uh, and this was uh, this is a topic of great conversation and that's the poverty line element that, that you've put together. We, we had uh, Michael Schellenberger uh, on last year. He wrote a book called Apocalypse Never about environmental alarmism actually holding us back and he pointed out that in fact in his opinion uh, raising people above the poverty line meant giving them enough energy and that oddly we might find that getting a lot more energy out there even if it were coal based. And he is quite a committed environmentalist uh, so he'd prefer nuclear, but getting it up there now was the best thing to do to reduce uh, to, to get to reduce the poverty, which in turn reduced the population. So that was an interesting argument. Now, uh, so I'd like to start really with uh, Hugh Purser. Hugh Purser says, regarding the concept of greater choice above the poverty line, is there evidence this applies regardless of society's political or religious structure, uh, especially with regard to education policies? Hmm. Um, that's an interesting one, and um, maybe the evidence from Afghanistan is uh, useful. It's it's just indicative. It's not final. Uh, if you look at Afghanistan, uh, the literacy rate of the under 25s is about 66%, I think, whereas the literacy rate of the over 65s is about 6%. And Afghanistan hasn't moved away from being a, a, a strongly Muslim society. What happened was that sort of a parallel set of beliefs were firmly instituted, in fact, by the Russians during their time in Afghanistan, and they set up the schools. So people have got, you know, two things running. Now, yes, there are signs that, you know, that may be reversed, some of that may be reversed, but I'm quite optimistic that, you know, given that, you know, two thirds of the population under 25 are literate, and it's well over half of the women, that actually the Taliban may not be as effective as they were last time they took over. So an illustration rather than a compendious answer. Sorry, I can't do a compendious answer. Okay. I can I can add a little bit from places where I've worked, and again, it's around literacy. Um, so in Indonesia and in Nepal, um, as people get literate and have more choices, they start to worry about things because they can. So they worry about pollution. They worry about uh, the air. They worry about, you know, in, in Indonesia, certainly in Jakarta, that they're getting so much flooding because they have the space and time and they can read about it. Mm -hmm. And they also uh, put higher value on access to health services because they understand the difference between a healthy and an unhealthy person through not just their immediate surroundings. Uh, Sean Turnbull is uh, dialing in from Australia has a, a question. Uh, you might find this slightly loaded, but uh, that's Sean. Uh, <laughs> 
Might you be able to suggest how we can reduce the plague of people on the planet sufficiently to allow humanity to survive and exist for eternity? As scientists suggest, this may require reducing global population from, say, 8 billion to 2 billion or less. Uh, Mm, I think uh, this is beware of what you wish for coming true. I'm not sure a two billion world will necessarily be better. I mean, I agree that uh, topping out at eight and maybe reducing to four or five is the likely trajectory. Uh, and that's going to take a whole load of adjusting to. Uh, uh, but the assumption of needing to go back to two because uh, we had a pattern of resource usage when we were at 2 billion that was sort of sustainable. I think the pattern of resource usage is changing as well. And so I'm not sure that apart from a disaster, we'd likely to go back to 2 billion. And I, I would prefer to be planning for a sort of 5 billion-ish uh, planet. But uh, I'm not sure, that doesn't sort of answer the question. It says, I don't agree with the question. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Okay, well, I'll, I'll stay off of that one, but I do think uh, the interesting thing to me is that we don't address population directly. We spend a lot of time on alarmism, and you go back to the old IPAD equation, uh, impact, environmental impact is population times affluence times technology, um, the old 70s debate. But in that, you, you keep coming back to population behind it, and then a lot of the assertions about poverty levels say, well, maybe my trend graph is wrong because if poverty drops then then it'll drop but there's no direct look at how, how to reduce population because it is a very political issue uh, but yeah. let's let's move yeah, along I, I mean Go ahead. i was just going to say our our what we have observed it's an observation this is not you know proper deep research and you know with anyway it, it, what we have observed is that as we as the world urbanizes, as, as population urbanizes, costs more money to have more children in the city. Um, they have better health, so they have a better chance of living. They get a better education, and they then have fewer children. And it's it's an observation. You know, look at China. Everybody thought that China was going to have, you know, just burst at the seams and keep growing. And the current what we're reading, the current estimate is that they're going to top out either this, within the next three years, their population is going to start falling. Okay. So I, I think, I, we think we're pretty optimistic about it. It may not go as fast as we need, but it's going a lot faster than, for instance, the UN had predicted. Great. Okay. Well, and maybe what just one, one other comment on that, of course, uh, when the Black Death halved the population, that was across all age groups. What's happening now is that uh, the sort of demographic profile is changing. And so you're getting sort of one child families with two parents, with four grandparents, with eight great grandparents, all alive at the same time. And, you know, that actually is a, a you know, a real challenge for, for, for society. Uh, and nobody really has started to talk about that much. Camilla Cavendish has a bit, but um, again, it's a bit uncomfortable and it's not very much discussed. Sorry, but Michael, back to you. Yeah, let's move along. Uh, John Knights, uh, I tend to agree that people in general are decent, especially if and when they bring their values to full consciousness, but is there any science and data to support this other than a few specific case studies? Um, I, the only data that would be valid would be neurological data. And there's neurological data about the things like the uh, behavior of single uh, children rather than children with siblings. But I don't know of any neurological experiments or data comparing people behaving decently and people behaving rottenly. Yeah, I mean, there, in, in the book that Ruth Bregman wrote, there are lots of examples where he dug up the evidence. So he's debunking, for instance, there's one about um, Easter Island, which was made out to be really bad with no proof because it would sell more books. Mm. But there, he, he's dug up the evidence, but 
you know, it's, it's working with people. It's, it's how scientific is it? He's done the best he can. Mm -hmm. And he's written mm -hmm. several books. So there are more books you can read in that style. And um, humankind okay. is just the further, furthest along he's come. Okay, so evidence to be accrued. Uh, now, we asked about pessimism. Uh, Brian Howard has, uh, has given us his fears. Uh, he says, uh, it's quite interesting, actually. Uh, Brian says, yeah, well, what about terrorism as well as global warming? Uh, society mm -hmm. increasingly threatened by scammers and fraud, you know, normal life, uh, continually disrupted by COVID and successive pandemics, and wealth mm -hmm. is still polarized. Mm -hmm. So, uh, any thoughts on... on <laughs> is, is, how off base is Brian if you're optimistic and, and predicting mm -hmm. the future? Is he, is he not aware of the future? Well, no, I think it's, it's a future. And the, the, I think the point is that uh, regulatory systems lag behind new technology. And, you know, we haven't found good ways of regulating that allow us to manage cyber terrorism. I, I think the, uh, the COVID uh, pandemic is an interesting example of nature taking care of itself because there seems to be evidence that the next wave is very uh, transmissible but actually uh, less virulent and so you know it's, it's different for different issues that you know and we, we can't we couldn't possibly we wouldn't want to deny that actually you know society's managing a lot of chaos uh, what we're, we're trying to do is step back and say, are people beginning to discuss these? Are people looking for levers and ways of managing it rather than going, oh, shit. And we're yeah. seeing less, oh, shit, and more, let's get on and do it. That's one of those technical futurist words, isn't it? <laughs> That's right. It is. <laughs> it is. I mean, the thing is, we all create our future. And we can sit back and say, oh, shit. Or we can say, okay, here's something I can do, something I, me, can do, not the government must. Because the thing that's going to make us, give us those preferable futures, have us some, get something that we want, is when we engage and do something ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, Nick Bertles, uh, do you think the UK government's current focus on ESG criteria for procurement will improve our environmental and social values? You know, will they continue to focus on it strongly? No, uh, yeah, I no. think um, <laughs> uh, I think the the idea behind ESG that um, uh, organisations should understand their footprint and understand what they're doing is right. Uh, any we we all know, you know, systems and metrics get gamed. Uh, the changing culture is important. The the metrics probably get in the way. Yeah. And I might point out that uh, you both, in fact, did a blog, as I recall, on it, uh, ESG Fad or Value Creator, back on the 4th yeah. of June, 2021, in the pamphleteers area. And I'll put that mm -hmm. link into the, um, into the chat. Yeah. In mm -hmm. Now, uh, Bob McDowell is curious, do you think that people who address their own challenges without excessive consultation with others have a more optimistic outlook and dis disposition? I think this is about agency. You know, when you, when you, we see, a, you know, you were seeing a lot of anger about, and you know, you, you, you listen to the NHS and people are having, you know, breakdowns. It's because I don't feel any ability to control anything. And when there are small things that you can do, that you can do, you feel better. You feel like you have some control. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, sort of adding to that, uh, I think it's really important that uh, people have more people they can communicate with because of technology. And, and you know, th this has a tremendous impact. Yeah, you know, it wasn't just the Yellow House example, it's all, all over the place that, you know, pe people are finding ways of energizing other people rather than, you know, just trying to do things on their own. I mean, yes, you, you always need, you know, people with ideas, and then people can agree or disagree with the ideas, but. Okay, we've got time for two more questions. A quick one from John Knights again. I'm not sure he's not sucking up to you here. Uh, do the authors agree the impact of the future role of women 
is way beyond their effect on procreation. Personally, I think the trend of more women leaders will be good for society in general and something we men can learn from. I think there's some evidence from uh, politics uh, that um, women have a different style of leadership and that in some circumstances it's the right style, it's a better style of leadership. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure in all circumstances it's a better style of leadership. You know, we, we had a discussion at one time about, uh, you know, the style of leadership you need in the army, for instance. The style of leadership you need in the army is just go do it uh, because you're in that sort of environment. Hmm? And, you know, those are the circumstances. In a lot of other circumstances, that isn't the style of management that's needed. And so I, I think um, uh, I wouldn't want to overstate the case, but I think there are there are lots of circumstances, a lot of societal things in which the uh, the female style of leadership seems to work better. OK, I'm asking uh, Peter to just set up the poll again. We're going to ask everybody in the audience for a second by and see if they've gotten more optimistic or more pessimistic. Uh, and while they're answering that poll, and they'll answer it quickly as they always do, I just want to set up our final, final question. Uh, back in 2004, Michael Crichton wrote a book called State of Fear. It was a, a thriller, as Crichton always is, uh, and he got a bit of a program on it simply because he had picked environmentalism as his as the cause that he was uh, kind of undermining. Um, but nevertheless, the, 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 the thesis behind the book was that the way in which uh, new ideas were sold, particularly by universities and think tanks, was scaremongering and fear, that that was the biggest thing of all. Uh, in fact, uh, Peter is now presenting the results, and as you can see, um, we've uh, basically not moved the audience very much. A few of those somewhere in between have moved to optimistic, uh, but only a few. So. Uh, We'll take those down, but a uh, very, very entrenched audience. But th th back to this uh, thesis of state of fear. Now, Bob McDowell uh, kicks in. Do you think that excessive self-analysis and introspection encourage pessimism about the future? You know, the past 20 months has been the seed ground for a lot of these attitudes and behaviors. And by way of observation, the inclination of media to highlight and feature bad news does little to promote a positive outlook for the future. I might add to that, uh, that this bias towards fear and bad news uh, does little to produce a balanced analysis of the future. So in our concluding minute, comments, please. I think we almost our starting point was that uh, negative news, fear, drama hits the headlines, sells newspapers, sell, is prevalent in you know, all of the media. Uh, and it's a lot easier than understanding what's going right. And, you know, that sort of is what we're trying to counterbalance. But I think it's a fact, you know, that that's where most of the media have to start from because that's that's their business. When when we actually, we, we had finished this book just at the start of 2020 and COVID hit. And that was a kind of, we had to rewrite and it's a very different book. And we just said, okay, it looks like we're going to hell in a handbasket. What are we going to do? And that sparked in us, where are things going right? Where can we find things that are working? How can we amplify those? And I think that's what's needed, more people sharing some of those good stories and looking for others. Good. Mm -hmm. Well, that is, a, that is a nice note on which to conclude. Uh, so if I may, I've got three quick brief rounds of thanks. Uh, firstly, as ever to our sponsors. Um, if you're not interested in the future, you probably aren't sponsoring us. So I'm sure that you've absolutely enjoyed today. Uh, secondly, I'd like to thank the audience. Uh, very good, lots of good questions in there and thanks for answering the poll. Uh, but most of all, uh, just a quick thanks to uh, Jill and Trish for sharing yet again, uh, some of their work, which we enjoy. Do please keep writing for pamphleteers. But you did brighten up a few days today because you did move 12% of the audience uh, from being somewhat to being optimistic. So uh, it's been a brighter <laughs> day for, 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 for some of us, thanks to your intervention. Okay. Unfortunately, I'm able, unable to open the floodgates of applause, but I have, as ever, my Korean karmic clapper, which is my technological tool. 
uh, which will allow us to, to to make everybody else a little bit happier today. Uh, and we look forward, as ever, to your work in the future and staying in touch. And thanks for coming back. Mm -hmm. Take care. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye.